What is up, everybody? Happy Victory Monday. Welcome into the Pack-A-Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Thanks so much for being here today. What a way to kick off the new year. January 1st, Packers Vikings, a 41 to 17 thrashing of the Minnesota Vikings. Not a win, not just a victory, a complete beatdown. And I, I mentioned this on Twitter. Normally, when you see a 41 to 17 score, that's not one of those scores where you're like, yeah, it was 41 17, but wasn't even that close. This is absolutely the case. It was 41 to 17. That score is not as close, uh, or it looks a lot closer than the game actually was, I should say. What a performance by the Green Bay Packers. 2023 is off to an amazing start. And let me start by saying this I will look you in the eye and I will tell you flat out, man to man, I was wrong. I was wrong. I didn't think that this team had the capability coming off a stretch in which they lost seven out of eight games, were one and seven in an eight game stretch. I didn't think they could come back and win the games that they needed to win to get themselves into a situation where they could be one more win and they're in the playoffs. Now, to be clear, job not done, right? The the, the next game, the, the Lions game, Lions-Packers next week is as important as anything else that's happened. All the help that they've gotten, all the wins that they've piled up over these last five weeks, four games in a bye, of course. Uh, all of that is great. It's all amazing. It's all been really, really fun. But if you don't get the win against the Lions, it doesn't matter all that much, right? So uh, job not done yet. But like I said, I will look you in the eye and tell you, I did not think that this team, the way that they were playing, had the capabilities of putting this sort of streak and this sort of stretch of play together. And I think the cool thing about sports and the cool thing, especially about football, is that you know, you're going to get some stuff right. You're going to get some stuff wrong, but like, it doesn't matter who you are or what you know, there's always going to be something to humble you at some point because uh, that's the the beauty of sports and that's the beauty of football. And like I said, I didn't expect a 4-0 stretch out of the Packers in these four weeks. Sure, they could easily pick up a win against the Bears in Chicago. The Bears are bad. Sure, they can pick up a win against the Rams at Lambeau Field coming off a bye. The Rams aren't good. They're starting a new quarterback in Baker Mayfield uh, after just signing, what, a week base, a week and a half beforehand. Like, yeah, you, you, you know, maybe you pick up those two wins. But, you know, going into Miami, getting a win on Christmas Day in a really key game, and then coming back and just blasting the Vikings at Lambeau Field. Meanwhile, all the teams that you need to lose are losing It's really been an incredible stretch and kudos to the Packers, kudos to Matt LaFleur, kudos to everyone within this organization uh, for being able to turn this around because that is no easy task. I I can't tell you enough. Like, man, I'm not so sure that there are, there's another franchise in the league right now. There's a couple we've seen out there the way that the Lions started this season. And that's what makes this game coming up potentially so fun. But the way the Lions started the season, the way the Steelers started the season, and now Steelers, Lions, Packers are all uh, at least in the conversation uh, for the playoffs going into this last week. Uh, There's a few teams that could weather a one in seven storm in the middle of a season, uh, but there's not many. And so many teams would crumble under that pressure and just under, especially, 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 especially when you had the expectations that the Packers had. It's one thing, and and again, credit to the Lions, credit to the Steelers, but Steelers without really having a quarterback coming into the season and the Lions are the Lions that just, they didn't have any real true expectations coming into the season. It's one thing when you start poorly and you didn't really have any expectations to begin with, but for this Green Bay Packers team to have literal Super Bowl aspirations, start three and one, and then see your season just seemingly collapse in a pretty magnificent way. Like I said, you lose five in a row, you lose seven of eight, and you're four and eight on the year. You've got, you know, a, a, not exactly an easy remaining schedule, and just everything looked awful. And to come back from that, bounce back from that, pick up four wins in a row, and to put themselves in a situation where they are win and in against the Lions to get into the playoffs. It's just, it's a real testament to the uh, fortitude of this organization and to what they were able to withstand when myself and many others put them, you know, dead to rights. And I'm so unbelievably happy that I was wrong. And I'm so unbelievably hoping that they can prove me wrong again and again and again, quite frankly, five more times because 
they do that and we will all be insanely happy as uh, the Packers would be you know, hoisting the Super Bowl trophy at that point. But a long way to go before we're there, but a really fun win. And I'll, I'll say this too. The, the Packers have clearly won games before, you know, this season prior to this game. This was the win. This was the first win this season that A, was just really fun. Like all the, like you, you beat the Bears in week two. You're supposed to beat the Bears. It was 20, like what, 27-10. And it's like, okay, like it, it was a fine game, but they, they didn't play great. They get the win. You're supposed to get the win. You get the win against what the Buccaneers and you, you know, you, you pick up some wins that were okay. You get the, the Patriots that started Brian Hoyer and Bailey, and then Bailey Zappi comes in. You have to go to overtime. Even the Bucks win, which felt okay at the time. You only put up 14 points in that game, win 14 to 12. Then you have the big losing streak. You get, I thought the Dallas win was the first one that at least gave uh, some shot of hope because you had the three touchdown outburst by Christian Watson and you went against a really good Cowboys team at Lambeau Field. That one had some signs. And then you beat the Bears in Chicago. That was a fairly ugly win, if we're being realistic. You beat the Rams at Lambeau. You're not sure what to make of that. You finally get what kind of feels like a good win against the Dolphins, especially in that second half. And then during the week, you find out Tua was concussed in the second half and he threw three picks in the second half, of course. So you're kind of wondering like, all right, was that really a signature moment or was that Tua just concussed and throwing us interceptions? And then you have this game. There's no excuse. There's nothing that you can undercut this win with. I, there was a few things that you would like, like the punt block, Rodgers and Watson, the timing was a little bit off. The red zone offense had a couple hiccups here and there. There's a couple things you'd like to have back that you could point to that they could do better, of course. All of that is fixable and workable. And for me, this was a win that showed this team can compete at a very high level still and that they can do the things that are necessary to be dangerous at times. And I don't know what that amounts to. I don't know if that just means they're going to win next week and get into the playoffs. I don't know if that means they're going to win next week and they're actually going to make some noise in the playoffs. I don't know. I'm I'm no I'm no longer going to put any limits on this team. They've been a very pleasant surprise as of late. But this was the win to me that showed legitimate signs of growth from this team because yeah, you, you know what? We can say that the Vikings are a little bit fraudulent. They're what, 12 and four with a negative 19-ish point differential somewhere around there. Like it, it's not been, it, it's been a weird season for the Vikings and they're probably not as good as their record would indicate. I, th I think it's fair to say that. At the same token, this is a team that's found ways to win football games, coming down from 30 points down against the Colts and, you know, winning that game. Like they've done some some pretty impressive stuff and just winning, you know, when you win 12 games, you can only sort of luck yourself so far. Like you win 12 games, you won 12 games. Like that is still an important, like that's the important stat, right? Is ultimately, did you win the football game at the end of the day? When you win 12, it's very, very difficult to fluke or fraud your way into 12 wins in today. Today's NFL, but this is still a team that has a Kirk Cousins led, you know, a quarterback who's had a very nice season. As much as we hate to admit it, he's had a very nice season prior to today. One of the best running backs in football, the best wide receiver, arguably in football, in Justin Jefferson. And Green Bay did a fantastic job against Cousins, against Cook, and specifically against Jefferson, which we'll talk about more in just a moment. And while the Vikings defense hasn't exactly been great as of late either, this is still a defense that boasted Daniil Hunter as Darius Smith. You know, Phillips and Tomlinson, you know, inside are very, very underrated. Kendrick said inside linebacker, Harrison Smith at safety, like. This is still a team that has some playmakers. So when you have a game where you completely blitz them, let's be real, 41 to three, the final 14 points were completely garbage time points, did not matter in any capacity. This is a 41 to three beatdown of the Minnesota Vikings, a team that has won 12 games and has some very special talent. When you show you can shut down a Justin Jefferson and contain you know, uh, Kirk Cousins to a very uh, subpar day, including three interceptions, when Dalvin Cook is completely contained, and when you're able to put points up on offense, defense, and special teams, that to me is a all-around performance and something that you can really, truly not only build off of, but like you, it, it feels different. It feels important. It feels like you you could you could go back at any of the other wins and say like yeah they're nice but there's no yeah but with this win this was a phenomenal win by the packers and uh, I love the way that 2023 is starting off and it's just a like a really fun game I don't have like 
that's that's what I want to describe it. It was a fun game for one of the first times this season that you just got to enjoy the hell out of it from beginning until, I guess, a little bit before the end because you had a couple fluke touchdowns at the end. But man, a fun victory. And uh, I'm really excited to see what Green Bay can do next week after this one. Now, it wouldn't have been maybe quite as fun, or at least it would have been a little bit more nervy had the Browns not been able to pull off the victory against the Commanders. There were two scenarios, remember, meaning that either the Giants needed to lose two games or the Commanders needed to lose one of their final two games. And you immediately got some bad news with the Giants game because the the Giants were just boat racing the Colts, as was kind of expected. You didn't really expect the Colts to to hang with them for too long. And that that game was over with basically before it ended. So, uh, or well before it ended, I should say. So, you have that, that game is out of the equation, which means you have to have the commanders lose a game. You don't really want it up to week 18 because you never know what teams are going to play their starters, rest their starters. You got some help from the Saints, which mean that the, the Eagles were probably going to have something to play for. The, you know, the Eagles and the Cowboys were probably going to have something to play for in week 18, uh, which would give you, you know, hope that, you know, maybe the commanders could still lose in week 18. But the fact that the Browns were able to pull off that win and just take all of the guesswork out of the equation, just giving the Packers the ability to hold their destiny in their hands, I I don't take it for granted. And I, I don't think it should get taken for granted that, you know, Aaron Rodgers and Matt LaFleur both talked about momentum in the postgame press conference. And Aaron Rodgers talked about he knew all the scenarios, all the playoff scenarios, who needed to win, who needed to lose. He said he was very cognizant of, you know, the Browns game and everything like that. I I have zero doubt in my mind that as Green Bay was winning a game, you know, wins against the Bears, wins against the Rams, and all of these other scenarios, the Commanders losing and the, the Seahawks losing and all these other scenarios that they needed to have play out, I do feel, and we, we heard Rodgers say the word destiny, like that just has to buoy you in the locker room of like, hey, not only are we winning, but like every single team that we need to lose has also lost. That just has to give you confidence and momentum and energy. And this team has used it and they've used it to their advantage. And it was really awesome to see Carson Wentz pull a Carson Wentz and a commander's franchise that tends to blow it late in the season, blew it late in the season. And the commanders owed the Packers one because if they, if Carson Wentz doesn't get hurt and he plays against the Packers, the Packers probably win that game and they're not in the same scenario anyway. So a huge thank you to Ron Rivera for actually starting Carson Wentz over Taylor Heineke, or you know what, who probably should have been the starting quarterback for weeks now, probably Sam Howell. Like, Either way, huge thank you to the commanders uh, for starting Carson Wentz and basically not uh, you know, almost to the extent of like not putting up a fight against the Browns. Uh, a horrible performance by Wentz and the commanders. A solid performance by the Browns. It doesn't matter. We never hopefully have to cheer for the Cleveland Browns again in uh, in you know needing the Packers to get into the playoffs in that scenario. But trying to be a Browns fan for a day was certainly not something that I want to experience again in my lifetime. So let's not have that happen again. But when when the Green Bay Packers needed the Cleveland Browns the most, somehow the Cleveland Browns of all teams pulled off the win that we needed them to pull off. And again, a huge thank you to the Browns franchise and to really the Commanders franchise for just you know really falling apart as they usually do at the end of the season. All right, let's jump into some of the real keys that happened in this game. I want to start with the defense or the fighting Joe Barry's, if you will. So much credit, first of all, to Joe Barry for, you know, really pulling this defense together. And at halftime of Packers Dolphins, man, you you had some serious questions again. And ever since then, the second half of Packers Dolphins and this entire Packers Vikings game, man, what a night and day difference. And we can talk about the individual plays, the Amos pick, the Savage pick, the, you know, all of it, right? Kenny Clark fumble, Rudy Ford's interception, all of them fantastic plays. And, and were really a huge reason you, you get a plus four turnover differential. You're, you're going to win the game, not to mention a kick return for a touchdown and all those sort of things. But those are all great and good. And again, well, more often than not, win you a football game, I was more impressed by how this defense played the intensity that this defense played with and how for the first time this season, this team played legitimate, true team defense. This team had 11 players that were doing their job and they were doing it collectively. There is a huge difference in the NFL 
between 11 individuals just doing the, their own thing, doing kind of their job or whatever, but playing 11, as 11 individuals. And a totally different thing when you have 11 players that are moving collectively, that are playing collectively, that are communicating collectively, that are rallying to the football. You can see it, you can feel it, and there is a tangible difference. The Packers defense from second half of Packers Dolphins into the entirety of this game before the end and the garbage time touchdowns and their backups were on the field played team defense, rallying to the football, playing their responsibilities, filling their gaps, playing more physical than I've seen them play in a long, long time. That was what really impressed me in this game. And again, credit to Joe Barry. And it started by all things with a blocked punt that pinned the, the Packers defense and put the, the Vikings offense at the Packers one yard line. 0-0 zero, zero at the time. We have seen this song and dance before. This is, this is not a scenario where, which is new to Packer fans. Huge game, Lambeau Field, blocked punt, about to lead to a touchdown for the opposing team. And we know the end of that story, right? And instead, First and goal from the one, a seemingly guaranteed walk-in Delvin Cook touchdown turns into zero points, or excuse me, three points, but you know, no touchdown, three points for the Vikings and a huge four-point swing for the Packers in their defense. And what Matt LaFleur described as a massive win in that moment, and there's no other way to describe it. You take over on your own one-yard line, pin deep uh, for the defense, and you only allow a field goal off of that. First of all, that's not points that I would attribute to the Packers defense. That's attributed to the Packers special teams, but that's a that's a plus four. That's a negative three for the, uh, the Packers special teams. That is a plus four, in my opinion, for the Packers defense, because that should be a touchdown. And I'll say quickly too, kudos to Dallin Levitt, because on that play, now maybe he could have blocked it up a little bit better. We could talk about that. So on the play, just really quick, on the punt, uh, uh, Jack Coco uh, kind of gets like picked off and then two Vikings come up the middle, and Dallin Levitt is staring down two Vikings coming right at him. At the same time, uh, one on each side, and you, there's only so much you can do. Like He can't just let one of them go. If he lets one of them go, like it's the easiest block in the world. So he has to do the best he can to kind of like get both guys. Both guys just annihilate him, and Metellus, I think, is the one who ultimately got the block. Yeah, and it's a, it's a nightmare of a play. It's something that Green Bay can fix moving forward. It's not something that I would look at and say like, oh, that's a, it's a major issue that they're going to have to like completely revamp the special teams or something. I, I think it's a, a fixable play. But uh, when Dal Levitt, it, he's laying down on the ground. He, like he's just got run over by two Vikings, right? For him to get up, quickly recognize the ball and then pick it up and, and try to get positive yardage. Now he ended up losing yards on that little, I guess, fumble recovering return or block recovering return, whatever you want to call it. But if he doesn't have the wherewithal to get up and pick up the ball, like if he just like lays on the ground and watches to see what happened, it's an easy seven points for the Vikings. So first of all, kudos to Levitt for getting up, identifying where the ball was and trying to make a play. Even though he's down at the one, it still saved them four points in the moment. And it ultimately saved them four points because the Packers defense came up with such a huge stop. But that goal line stand, in my opinion, started everything for the day. That, that seven nothing, probably still overcomable. And Aaron Rodgers mentioned that he felt like they were gonna win the entirety of the game anyway. So like even he said, like even if they scored seven there, he felt like they were easily gonna, well, not easily, they were gonna come away with the win at the end of the day. But man, it just, it helps your momentum. It helps your, uh, it just it just helps everything for the remainder of the game and just not feeling like you're immediately behind the eight ball right away with a seven nothing deficit. So I can't say enough about that. And then, you know, all the, the huge plays, the Darnell Savage interception, the Rudy Ford interception, the Amos interception, the Clark uh, strip sack, and then the, the immediate recovery, like all huge plays. And again, you end up plus four in the turnover battle. You're going to win just about every single time. And then how about Jire freaking Alexander too? And with Alexander, right, you've got a player who chirped all week long and was going against the best wide receiver in football. And he played man coverage. He pressed him. He jammed him. He did a lot of different stuff. And, uh, and you know, he ends up, Justin Jefferson ends up with one catch on the day. A phenomenal performance by Jair Alexander. I've been talking about 
this team needs their stars to play like stars. Jair Alexander played like a freaking star on Sunday, and it was fun to watch. That is the Jair Alexander that we've kind of been waiting for. And I'm not saying he's had like a bad season. He's come up with some big plays, but I don't think it was a, a like, I don't think this has been a clear classic Jair Alexander season by his standards. That that might have been, you go back to that Rams game a few years ago where he just like batted every pass away for the entirety of the game. Uh, this might have been up there, quite honestly, uh, with that game as one of Jair's best performances, in my opinion. We'll see what the All-22 says when the tape comes out. I always hate making those declarations before we see it on uh, you know, on the, the full version. But man, I, at first glance and on rewatch, I was so impressed with the way he played. And when you've got one of the best that we've seen in Justin Jefferson out there and you have to man him up for a huge portion of the game and you do it, whew, that is a super impressive performance, especially when you've been chirping all week and you have the ability to go out there and back that up. And you know Jefferson after... Alexander had the, you know, audacity, I guess, to say that the the first game for Jess Jefferson was a fluke. Man, you know Jefferson wanted to go out there and put 200 on Jair. And to only have one catch is, and kudos to the entire Packers defense, but man, Jair, massive, massive performance. Absolutely love to see that from him. And just going back to Darnell Savage and Rudy Ford for just a moment as well. Darnell Savage, and I got I got to thankfully ask Matt LaFleur about this in the postgame presser, but Darnell Savage was benched and deservedly so, completely deservedly so. And that can go in one of two directions, right? You've got a player that checks out and is just like, you know what, whatever, you can bench me. I'm not going to you know do anything different, whatever. Or you can have a player who legitimately responds to it. This is a first round pick. This is a multi-year starter, basically starter since the day he got into the league. This is a guy who just got his fifth year guaranteed nine plus million going into next season, despite having a, a tougher year last year. And now for really the first time, he got called out for it and he got benched and he could have went in the totally different direction. And instead he owned it. He got better from it. And I mentioned it last week in the 30 or whatever snaps that he played. That was some of the best football I saw Darnell Savage play. And in this week, I'm so excited to watch the L22 and, and LaFleur already shouted him out in the postgame presser as well. His ability to bounce back from that has been massive these past two weeks. And I'm so excited. I, I can't wait to watch the tape on him. And he deserves a lot of credit for doing that because not a lot of players would respond in that same way. And you can say the same thing about Rudy Ford, right? Rudy Ford started the year on the bench, not really a factor on this Packers defense. Then he got in the starting lineup, made a bunch of big plays. And then last week, remember, he got benched too. They put Savage back in, they pulled Ford out. Even in nickel and dime, it was Innis Gaines and Tariq Carpenter. Ford got taken out. He was out of that game against the Dolphins. And the defense responded huge in the second half. This week, who's back in there as a starter? It's Rudy Ford. And who responds with a big game? Rudy Ford. Another huge interception. The guy has just made play after play after play. So uh, kudos to those guys who, you know, when you get benched like that, you, again, it can go it can go very wrong. And for those guys that has gone very right, and especially with Darnell Savage. So a, a couple other things about this Packers defense. Prior to the two garbage time touchdowns, we're just, if those didn't happen, we're erasing them from history. The Packers from the, the second half of the Dolphins up until those final two, you know, touchdown drives by the Vikings that didn't happen, obviously. Uh, there were 12 drives for the Packers defense, 12 drives. These were how those 12 drives ended. Interception, in, in order, by the way. Interception, 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 three and out, Goal line stand that resulted in a field goal. That field goal was not a result of the defense. That was the one that took, you know, place started at the one yard line. They actually went backwards. But so interception, 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 three and out. Goal line stand that resulted in a field goal. Three and out, pick six, miss field goal, interception, miss field goal, force fumble slash recovery, interception. That is in freaking sane. So you have 12 possessions. You have six interceptions. Half of those, half of their defensive possessions ended in an interception from the second half of Dolphins up until the final two drives for the Vikings, where they again garbage time touchdowns. 12 possessions, six interceptions, including a pick six, a fumble recovery, and only three points allowed, which were not their fault, which I would give them a plus 4-4 four four on the play because the drive started at the one freaking yard line. That is incredible. 
And we're not talking about like, yeah, they faced the Texans and the Bears. Like, no, this was the Dolphins offense with Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddell. And this is the Vikings offense with Justin Jefferson and, and Dalvin Cook and TJ Hawkinson and Adam Thielen. Like these are good offenses. A 12 drive or a 12, uh, you know, possessions, uh, you know, stretch like that, that is completely, completely unheard of. And you look at it this way. Before the garbage time points from that stretch, from the you know the, the second half of the Dolphins uh, up until the, the garbage time points, the Packers defense and special teams combined for 14 points and allowed only three. They were plus 11 from second half of Dolphins up until gar- you know garbage points. Plus 11 points. Your defense and special teams, meaning if your offense didn't even take the field, if the offense didn't put up a single point, they would have won 14 to three from the second half of Dolphins through the garbage time, or just before garbage time against the Vikings. A unbelievable stretch. And again, credit to Joe Barry and company for making that happen. And a defense that is finding its identity and actually playing team defense. All right, that brings me to Keyshawn Nixon. Keyshawn Nixon played two plays in this game. He did not play defense. He was not even remotely close to being involved on defense, so much so that when like so what happens for if if anyone hasn't been able to like kind of see the sidelines you've got your defense that's in the game and then you've got like three huddles you've got your defensive back huddle you've got your linebacker huddle you've got your defensive line you might have an edge rusher it might be like four huddles or whatever but you've got all these different huddles of all the players that could go in the game in a moment's notice so you've got your backup safety standing together your corners your linebackers your edge rushers your defensive linemen so they'll be lined up like right on the sideline if somebody needs to go in uh and or sub out whatever Keyshawn Nixon was not in the defensive back group that would be able to go in it was all, all the other corners not Keyshawn so He had no plans of being involved in the defense in this game, just coming off of the injury, which means he had literally one job. He had two plays that he played in this game. One is a kick returner. One is a punt returner. The punt return went for 10 yards, which he aggressively fielded and made a great play on and got 10 yards out of it, which (laughs) just remember a 10 yard punt return, like the last two years would have been like, like we would have been facetiously celebrating a 10 yard punt return. Like we all just won like the $500 million lottery. Like though the 10 yard punt returns were, uh, were not exactly something that we saw on a regular basis. That was his bad play. And then he had a 105 yard kick return for a touchdown as well, which was really poorly covered by the Minnesota Vikings. They left a gaping hole in the middle of the field, but it was also blocked up really well. And I posted a picture on Twitter, uh, of Nixon fielding the ball and you've got the entire Packers special teams hitting their targets. I'm not a big special teams guy. I will be the first to tell you that. But the way that that looked to me was that you had every single player at their target perfectly spaced. Like it looked like something out of a special teams, you know, field manual or coaching guide, whatever. It was really pretty. And you could just tell, you can tell this special team is just different under Rich Passaggi. And I jokingly posted, you know, after the punt block that the 2023 special teams just look like every other special teams we've ever seen, because of course it started with a punt block, but man, outside of that punt block, which is still, you need to get that cleaned up. That stuff cannot happen, but you've got Mason Crosby kicking 56 yard field goals. You've got 105 yard kick returns. Like uh, this special teams is better and we're seeing some of the results of it. And even in a day where they allowed a really poor, uh, you know, punt block or a really bad punt block, they still were a massive net positive in this game in large part due to Keyshawn Nixon, who I am now very much in the camp for needs to have a package on offense once he's fully healthy, because I need to see a offensive play that has Nixon and Jones and Watson and Dobbs on the field at the same time. So Matt LaFleur, and I know you're listening, I know you're a big, you know, pack a day podcast fan. Uh, make sure that we get, you know, couples, even if he's just a decoy, right? Like we we had a couple Samore Toure uh, decoy fake handoff runs and a couple that went like fake handoff to Lazard. I promise you, Keyshawn Nixon's coming around. Even if that's just a fake handoff, that just does a little bit extra for a defense that's like, oh, Keyshawn Nixon's in the game. We probably need to be aware of that a little bit more than if, you know, Alan Lazard's on a fake end around, right? So just get him in the game. I promise you good things will happen because it seemingly always does. A couple other notes here. I want to shout out the Packers, and I kind of mentioned this at the beginning as well, but shout out to the Packers facing adversity. You lose five in a row and you lose seven of eight. 
you're down 19 to 10 to the Bears in the fourth quarter. Going into the fourth quarter, you're down 19 to 10 after losing seven out of eight games. They had multiple opportunities to fold in that game. They somehow came back, found a way to win. They were down 20 to 10 to the Dolphins, somehow fought back, found a way to win. You've got the block punt early in this game. Like I said, we've seen this one before. Vikings go in, score a touchdown, and the rest is history. Packers never really get back in it, and the season's over. They fought back. They held them to a field goal. They boat raced the Vikings from there, and the rest is history. This is a team for the first time that faced not like not just a little bit of adversity in the regular season, a absolute metric crap ton of adversity in the regular season. You lose seven of eight as a expected Super Bowl contender in the middle of your season, and yeah, you can bet you are going to face a ton of adversity. This team did. They overcame it. And you look back to those other three Matt LaFleur-led seasons, right? 2019, the first time that they really had adversity was when they lost to the San Francisco 49ers in the NFC Championship game. And guess what? You don't get to overcome that adversity. Your season was over. In 2020, you can make a strong argument. The first adversity that that team faced was when they lost to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the NFC Championship. You know what? You can't overcome that adversity because your season's over and you turn the page to the next year. In 2021, now I'm not saying there's none, right? You have injuries to David Bakhtiari and Elton Jenkins and some other stuff, but like Remember, they had never lost back-to-back regular season games in the Matt LaFleur era. They won 13 games every single year. This is not a team that had faced a ton of adversity in 2021. Same thing. You can make a strong argument that the the real first adversity that they faced was when they lost to the 49ers in the divisional round. And guess what? You can't overcome that adversity. Your season's over. You flip the page to the next year. This is not a team in the Matt LaFleur era that had to face adversity in the regular season. And in my opinion, because of that, it cost them in the postseason. They didn't really have an opportunity to grow from the mistakes and grow from the adversity that they had to face in the regular season. And I think it made them a little bit softer in the playoffs. They're not there yet. And they could easily just get beat the crap out of them in the first round of the playoffs again. Who knows? But I do think that this team is tougher and they deserve the credit that they've earned for overcoming adversity in an extremely tough season due to their own fault. I'm not saying that like, well, you know, everything just bounced the wrong way and that's why the pack, no, they they played bad football, but you play bad football, that's almost the hardest adversity to overcome. And somehow they found a way, give Aaron Rodgers and his leadership a lot of credit, give Matt LaFleur and his leadership a lot of credit. This is a team that faced a lot of adversity, overcame a ton of adversity, and now we're in a position to actually make the playoffs. Some quick logistical things. Uh, Base defense in the secondary, we were back to Savage and Amos as your core safeties with Douglas and Jair as your main corners. Then in nickel, Rudy Ford came in, Darnell Savage moved to the slot, and then in dime, we saw Innis Gaines in that situation. So that was your uh, base nickel dime defense. We also saw Zach Tom going at right tackle. So apparently what happened, so Nyman gets hurt, a a little bit banged up. But then it was interesting because Nyman was in on like the, the field goal units and he was had his helmet on ready to go in in one of those little side huddles with the offensive linemen. It looked like he was good to play and he did play on special teams, right? So like you're thinking maybe this is a rotation of some sort. So what happened is Nyman went down, Tom went in, and then with Nyman just being like a little banged up but cleared, they just decided to keep Tom in the game. It'll be really interesting to see what they ultimately do with that moving forward. If it's just Zach Tom's spot now, I mentioned during the week, I said Zach Tom's one of their best five offensive linemen, but I have a hard time making an argument of where he should play and who he should take out of the game. Well, he ends up playing right tackle, and now it's going to be really interesting to see who ultimately ends up with that right tackle spot if it goes back to Yash or if that's just Zach Tom's job now because uh, it'll just be very interesting to keep an eye on and and seeing what happens there. I thought Tom played well uh, from what I saw, but again, we'll take a look at the All-22 and we'll have the film breakdown later this week. Uh, Mason Crosby, Ramiz Ahmed, interesting situation there. First of all, awesome game for Mason Crosby, hitting 56-yard field goals. What a resurgence that he has made on his career this season, having a really sound, solid season. Ramiz Ahmed gets called up to do the kickoffs. He hurts his groin, I think it was his groin, in uh, in 
pregame workouts or in pregame warmups and isn't able to kick. So they literally bring up a kicker from the practice squad just to kick off to the Vikings and, and Wanwu, who's a phenomenal returner. And then he can't. And then I thought Crosby had a couple really nice kicks, coffin corners, a couple um, like little um, squib kicks that worked well. So just a really nice day from Crosby overall. And of course, they call up a second kicker and he injures himself in pregame warmups, which is, of course, that would happen. Aaron Jones, 14 carries, 111 yards, thought he had a phenomenal day. And then really, really nice to see Robert Tunyon a little bit more involved. Three catches, 52 yards, and a touchdown. Uh, you, you see him get open on the corner route. That was a really nice route by him. Rodgers finds him a little bit late, but uh, corner of the end zone, beautiful play. And then even a little bit later on the little like bootleg action, he's rumbling down the field. I think ran, you know, I don't know if he ran a guy over, but you know, still we, we saw a, a much uh, more spry Robert Tunyon, much more active Robert Tunyon in this game. And that was a real positive as well. On the flip side, Darius Smith refuses to shake hands with any Packers on the coin toss. Amos goes over to him. Z still ignores him. So real tough guy stuff, you know, pregame when it's coin toss time. Well, Darius Smith had zero quarterback hits. Uh, the new 55, Kingsley and Igbari, the rookie, had two quarterback hits in this game. So Real easy to be a tough guy pregame, but uh, didn't exactly back it up through the remainder of the game and really good stuff from really the entirety of the Packers offensive line, including Bakhtiari, Jenkins, who saw him sometime in the interior, Zach Tom, Yash Nyman, et cetera. So they really shut down Sedarius Smith through the entirety of that game. And then uh, a couple other quick notes from the fourth quarter of the Bears game. Uh, so fourth quarter of the Bears game until just before the two garbage time Vikings touchdowns, Packers outscored the Bears, Rams, Dolphins, and Vikings 109 to 35, a plus 74 point differential from fourth quarter Bears to just before the two garbage time touchdowns against the Vikings. So quite the incredible run there. No real injuries for the Packers in this game that were announced other than Ramiz Ahmed with the pregame injury. So if you were hoping for a, a big Ramiz Ahmed showing the remainder of the year, we're going to have to keep a very close eye on the injury report as we go forward this week. Uh, we also are, I'm sure, going to be talking a lot about red zone this week. The Packers are now facing the Lions in a must-win situation. If you remember that last Lions game, which you've probably uh, tried your best to forget, these were some of the situations in a game where the Packers lost by six points. They had first and goal at the Lions' five-yard line. They got zero points. First and goal from the Lions' one-yard line. They got zero points. First and 10 from the Lions' 23-yard line. They got zero points. First and 10 from the Lions' 14-yard line. They got three points. First and 10 from the Lions' 17-yard line. They got zero points. They were at the Lions' five, the one, the 23, the 14, and the seven, and got three points out of those five drives. So, Red zone offense has been a struggle for the Packers this season. It literally cost them a game against the Lions earlier this year. I can promise you that is going to be a huge focal point of the Packers this week. And of course, the Packers will now face the Lions on Sunday with the playoffs on the line. It is a must win for the Packers. A tie does them nothing. A loss does them nothing. It is win and they are in. If they win, nothing else that happens matters. They are in. They can only get the seven seed. The sixth seed is out the window. It is win and you get the seventh seed, tie or lose, and you are done. You will not go on to the playoffs. So they've got one opportunity, one shot, and the only thing that they can do is win the game. Uh, if you're wondering what could happen if the Packers don't win, which I don't, you know, we're not even going to bring that into fruition, but if the Seahawks win and the Packers lose, the Seahawks are in. If the Packers lose and the Seahawks lose, the Lions are in. So that number seven seed will be either the Packers, the Lions, or the Seahawks, and only the Packers have their own destiny in their hands. So as mentioned at the onset, job not done yet. One more win and the Packers are in the playoffs. They hold the des their own destiny in their own hands, and it has been quite the journey on a fairly bizarre, random, weird, unpredictable season. Yet at the end, one week to go, one more win at Lambeau Field in January, and they will be playoff bound once again in the four years that Matt LaFleur has been head coach. That is going to do it for me today. Hope you enjoyed the heck out of that Packers beatdown of the Minnesota Vikings. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please make sure to comment and like and subscribe, all those things that all helps, helps the algorithm. So really appreciate all of you. I'll be right back here tomorrow with an all new episode. But until next time, and as always, Go Paco.